Are you ready? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Greatly Destined Podcast. It's your host, as you know, Uzezi. And today I have a special guest with me today. Very funny guy, fellow Milwaukee comic of mine, Andrew Flaggy. Where's that last name come from, Flaggy? It's German. German. Uh, I think it's, so I think it's supposed to be Flugy, and I think it got screwed up whenever my family moved here. Because I've met so many people whose last name is spelled F-L-U-E-G-G-E. Mm-hmm. It's like Flugy or whatever. But I've never met anybody with exactly my last name. I've met a lot of flags with two Gs. But never my exact last name, which is really odd, I think. Have you ever been back to Germany? You mind moving the microphone just a little closer to no, you? No, I've never been to Germany. Like the whole thing, just push it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, no, I've, never, I've never been to Germany. Never so. been to Germany. No. I, you know, we know Louisa, so we can just talk to that's her about a, it. <laughs> that's a good thing, though, because Germans are the scary white people. Well, I, I, are I, intimidating I, over there in Germany. I have a joke about that, how like I'm four things. I'm German, Polish, Czech, and 6% Italian. So. Those are all of the scariest whites except for Italian. Exactly. Those, <laughs> those, the Italians are the Mexicans of Europeans. Mexicans, so, yeah. I like that. I've never yeah. heard that one before. The Mexicans of Europeans. Some yeah. Italians look very Mexican. I don't know yeah. what that's about. Is there a connection there? Spain. Spain conquered both Mexico and Italy. No, no, no. Uh, Spain didn't conquer Italy, I don't think. So why do they? Why do some Italians look Mexican? I don't know. Just because it's all Mediterranean, you know, they're all around like the ocean. And then all... their flag is very similar, except that it doesn't have that like bird. With There's the not eagle. too many. I mean, come on, how how many flags change out there? You know, that's true. We just get ID. Nobody's creative, huh? Yeah. It's, <laughs> there's like there's only so many colors you can use. That ass. Like, you just start putting. <laughs> it basically, it's like you get conquered. You just put a gun on it. Like that's all you do now at this point. Dead ass. There's so many flags that have like the the three same colors, yeah. and there's a pattern. And then another country just sees it. I like that flag. And they just changed the pattern. You know how many of them are like red, white, and blue? Like America, we're just like, yeah, more stripes, dude. Like I'm saying. America has like the stripes and everything, but they just, it's the stars. They conquer yeah. a country and they're like, we have 50 stars. We'll give you one big ass star right there yeah. just and call you a different nation. It's, I, I forgot what country it is. That just like Is it like Cameroon or something like that that just has the AK-47 on the fucking flag? Really? I, I would have seen that. I forgot what country it is that has it. I, I, it's either it's either like a Russian, like former Soviet state, or it's like an African warlord country. It's probably one of those two. <laughs> those are the fucking the ruffians of the world. Yeah. Those Eastern Europeans and those Africans. Yeah. They're just out there just being like, well, I mean, this gun Fuck it. fires. <laughs> it, it shoots underwater. It's pretty sick. Like, I'm saying... Hey man, thanks for coming on this show, brother. I wanted to come, I wanted to bring you on this show because not only are you a funny guy, you have a show coming up, right, on the uh, first. Yeah, yeah, at uh, it's at Oak Brewing in uh, West Dallas. Okay, it's a free show, so that's gonna okay. be pretty sick. What uh, what got you into comedy? I always liked roast battles, honestly. Like I liked roasting and stuff. Like I love the Comedy Central roasts and everything like that. You look like you like roasting. I know. I, if we I'm, went to high school together, you look like you would have bullied me. Yeah, I'm like I'm like the, I'm like the fat insecure guy that's got to be like, you know this why you're gay? Everybody. Like it's just like it's like preemptive strikes constantly. No, I feel that. I feel that. Were you were you made fun of in high school? or Did you do the making fun of? No, actually, I kind of didn't do either. Mm. Honestly, I just had like my group of friends that uh, I played like Xbox with and hung out with and stuff. Other than that, like it, I, I had like two girlfriends in high school. Um, chilling. Yeah, they were kind of like whatever high school long term relationship kind of things, and I, I don't know. It was just like typical. It wasn't like a standout high school experience. I wasn't like cool, but I wasn't like bullied or anything. Yeah, I just kind of was there. I heard somebody say most comedians were bullied when they were younger, and that's why they could um they could manage that. Like, you know, when you first start doing comedy, you're going to be bombing, like, 80% of your sets. And yeah. it's bad. It's and only a certain... That. Yeah, bump that number <laughs> up a little bit. Those are- and only a certain amount of people can take that. And generally, it's people who humiliation is... It's not unfamiliar to them. You know, they're familiar yeah. with that feeling. If you're like, I was made... I remember this type of feeling in high school. I survived, or middle school, or whatever. I survived, so I can, I can endure this and stand up and... And push through till I get good. Yeah. I feel like that's common. It makes sense. I think a lot of mine was honestly, um, I like to goof around. Like, you know, I like to like joke around and stuff, but it was never like exuberant. But Mm -hmm. even like with like my family, like my dad um, didn't really let 
me have opinions or have say in like adult things. Like when we were, like, I'm the oldest. They had a grown folk business. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like the adults are talking. So it's like you know if they were talking about something politically, and you're like, ah, that politician sucks, and they'd really? be like, they'd be like, shut up, don't talk. Like, yeah, I didn't know white people do that. What talk about politics? No, <laughs> no. How, how do you think we I took said, over the world? We're con- facts. We're at our lake houses conspiring. Yeah, that's all white people do. We know that. <laughs> But I'm saying I didn't know like white people like you swim parents. Swim out to the raft and talk. I didn't know <laughs> white parents um, tell like the younger ones to stay out of grown folks' business and stuff like that. I thought you guys, I at least from the outside looking in, black people have this um, idea that like white kids got a lot more freedom to speak their mind. Mm, I mean, is maybe, that not true? Maybe now. I mean, I, like I'm 32, so like, and then also I was like the first kid in the family. Like, my parents had me, and then my cousin Michael is two years younger than me. And, like, we're the two oldest. And uh, so, like, it was a lot of, I guess, like, we were, like, the trial period family thing. And my family's, like, really close, too. Like, mm-hmm. we like we spent a lot of summers and everything together, and, like, we did, like, big family Christmases and stuff. So it's, like, things like that. Like, they were all around, and, like, all the, like, the adults would be talking, but it was kind of, like, one of the things with, like, the kids, like, you will speak when spoken to kind of yeah. things. Yeah. So it's like that. And then it's like finding an outlet with comedy and everything like that. Because I didn't do particularly great in high school or anything. Like, I wasn't like a, like a D or an F student. Just getting by. But I was, yeah, I was getting by. I was like, you know, whatever, slacking off. I didn't like doing homework, but I absorbed everything and shit. Like, it was one mm. of those, like, if I applied myself, probably things would have been a lot better. But, like, so, like, I just kind of, like, never knew, like, where, like, how to voice my opinions. Like, I loved Comedy Central. Like, they always did Friday Night Stand Up. They did Premium Blend. They did, like, all that stuff, which was pretty awesome. Like, they had that Friday Night lineup. And I would just sit in my room and watch Stand Up. And then they started doing Comedy Central roasts. I'm like, yo, you can be mean to your friends and people like it? Like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, like, there was a place called the Comedy Cafe. Uh, They did an open mic competition. Um, They did an open mic competition uh, the last Thursday of the month, Mm -hmm. I think. And you could, I think you could win money. I never did. I I think the highest I ever placed was like sixth. Where was this? In Milwaukee? Yeah. So you know where the up-down is on Brady Street? I do know where the up-down is. That used to be a comedy club. They demoed the whole thing. That would have been a nice one. Yeah. It was, well, it was kind of a shitty comedy club. Really? Oh, they just renovated it and made it nice. I mean, the laughing tap and the improv are better than what Comedy Cafe was. (laughs) Like those, like the two we have. And, like, the Laughing Tap has, like, a small, like, I, I'm assuming they have a smaller budget than, like, what Comedy Cafe had. And they've just, those three have done such a better job of making a comedy club locally. But it's also so specifically local and stuff that it's, like, it's got a little bit more of a charm to it. Mm-hmm. Like, it just felt like Comedy Cafe was, like, a club that was just, like, it's like a money laundering front. You know, it's like, okay, we're here to sell drinks, not entertain people. Isn't we're, that what most comedy clubs are? No, because, I mean, the drinks go with it, but I th- like, especially, like, having known Matt Kempel for so long, I think he genuinely really wants to bring, like, a good show to people. And if they – and he understands that, like, putting on the best show possible is going to get somebody to, like, buy drinks because they're going to be like, oh, I'm really having fun. And then the experience will lead to them spending money or yeah. being repeat customers and coming back. But I think he wants the experience first. Mm-hmm. And it's a great way that I think that he runs that place. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the same for Greg and Caitlin, too. Doing you can make stuff. a lot of money as a comic if you go around to clubs and you charge the bar, right? As, uh, if you have a lot, if you have the name, like the, the, the star power. Yeah, depending on if you do like drink sales. Usually, I, the, all the people that I've worked with that I've kind of asked, because I don't like to get into people's finances because I think it's just kind of rude. Yeah. But like, you like, got to ask in a slick way, not like a direct way. Yeah, it's like doing like, either doing like a door deal or do it, you know, it's like you could like door deal, ticket sales, you know, or if you split the bar 50 50. I don't, I, I mean, the best person to have on would be 50 50? I mean, I've heard of people talking about doing it. I've never heard of anyone getting that way. Like, um, I have, I have no idea. That's a lot. Yeah. But also, it's I don't like, think like 10% is what like, like somebody like Godfrey, when I went to the improv, he probably had maybe 300 people there, 300 people drinking. If you 50 percent well, of yeah. 300 people drinking expensive drinks, you that's like yeah. a ten thousand dollar weekend. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I know for a fact the improv has run out of drinks on several weekends like they uh, the Shane Gillis weekend. I know they ran out of like Bud Light and like shithead beers like that mm-hmm. was pretty funny that they ran out of all that because that's totally his like podcast. So that was pretty cool. But like, that just tells you how, how comedy is. Yeah, like, in you your put yourself base. out there, your fan base is going to be just like you. Yeah, Makes sense. exactly. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, you're, it's exactly who you're marketing to. And it's like, yeah, they're, they're going to buy all that stuff out. Um, uh, I think the Brendan Schaub weekend, when I when I did that one a couple weeks ago, 
they I they ran out of they ran out of Guinness. Like I was like, that's weird that they ran out of that one. I mean, maybe they don't over order it. Mm-hmm. But like I like Guinness, especially in the winter. Like I I like thick beers like that. Like I call it a loaf of beer because it's so you know it's it, it's thick and it's like really carb heavy and uh, they ran out of it. I was like, what the hell? Like how'd you guys run out of Guinness? Like, but uh, that was that was people fun. ordering Guinness, man. They trying to get drunk. They they trying to turn up. Uh, the Big J weekend. I know they ran out of like White Claws and like a bunch of beers. Like the Legion of Skanks fans just bought up so much shit. Who's your favorite comic that you've seen at the Improv? Oh, it's Big J. I Big mean, J. he's he's my favorite, and I, I was so happy I got to open for him. It was super cool. Yes. You are you. Who have you opened for? You said you opened for Brandon Schwab. That's a yeah. That was a last minute thing. He usually brings, that's a name. He usually brings his uh, his opener, and I think it's his brother, like his youngest brother or something like that. Really? And his he got sick, and oh. his manager called the club and said, "Hey, do you have anybody that can open?" And the GM of the club was like, "Oh yeah, I got this guy Drew. He can totally do it." So they sent over my clips, and then they watched like five minutes of a clip, and they're like, "He'll be fine." And they just threw me on there. But if you want the rundown of the people I've worked with, uh, at the Laughing Tap this year, I worked with Sean Patton, which was a big one, and then I got Monroe Martin, who's Monroe he's, Martin. He's awesome. You know Monroe Martin. Do you know who he is? I've I heard about him through that show. Yeah, uh, he's Monroe Martin's awesome. I just like him because he's been on things like uh, like real ass podcast and stuff. Mm-hmm. He's been on like Louis J Gomez's podcast. He's kind of in like that Legion of Skanks world of like New York comics. And uh, I just really wanted to see his hour, and I knew who he was, and I just kind of asked. I was like, could I, could I get on that show? I'd really like to do it. That'd be super fun. And uh, his hour was so good. Like, it was a full circle. I don't even want to, like, kind of give it away because I'm hoping he turns it into a special at some point. Mm-hmm. But, like, it starts off with him going through the foster care system and, like, growing all the way up, and it comes all the way back around full circle to after COVID, him meeting up with his birth father. Oh, wow. And it's, he wraps up this whole thing. It's, like, a whole big circular story. And it's So really everything funny. is connected yeah. on his side. It's, like, a progression of his life, basically. And it, oh, was, wow. it was really cool, like, growing up in Philly and stuff. Yeah, it was a really, really cool hour. I liked watching it. That's very organized. I got to watch it four times. Yeah, it was two shows each night on two nights. And, I mean, watching him do that hour each time and do little tweaks here and there for an hour, you're not going to nail it, you know, one for one every time. But, like, the way he integrated all the different stories he had was, well, it was brilliant. Like, I really liked it a lot. That's very organized. That's um, tough to do. But then, yeah, I did. Uh, so, at the improv, I opened for uh, Steve Ren is easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he was on the league. I the which one was he? I remember I wa- used to watch the league. He was Kevin. He was like the commissioner of the league. Oh, the main dude. Uh, no, that's that Pete. was married to Pete's. like the pretty girl. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. Kevin MacArthur. Yes. Uh, so uh, I opened for Steve Renazizi. That was the first weekend I ever got there. Uh, Shane Gillis gave me a guest set on a show. That was pretty cool of him to do that. He gave me like ten minutes on a show. AJ Grill was actually hosting that weekend. Then I got uh, Big J Okerson. I opened for Punky Johnson uh, from SNL. Punky Johnson. Uh, Brendan Schaub. And then uh, I also got the call off the bench for like a one-nighter with doing um, Doug Stanhope, which is probably the biggest name that I've opened for. And Doug Stanhope was fucking cool. Do you put anything on social media? Uh, what do you mean? Like um, like your clips and I do, but reels. I, don't, I don't do reels or anything like that. I just... I know I should. I just don't care about doing it because I also feel like I'm giving away shit for free. And I don't mm. I don't try to fuck around with crowd work that much. So, like, I don't – I should be recording more and more stuff. That's why, like, the reels will be, like, literally just, like, their one-liners maybe because yeah. it's, like, you're not giving too much away. Yeah, yeah. That, mm. I mean, that's kind of the way to do it. Like, I mean, like, I, I come across the reels all the time, and, like, I always see, like, Kelsey Cook on there, and, like, her, like, crowd work shit is really funny. Mm. And I'm like, God damn it, like, she's really good at that shit. You know um, who's good at crowd work? What? Andrew Schultz is a good. Oh, Schultz is the man, dude. He's the fuck. That's my favorite comic right now. Yeah. Oh, did yeah. you see Infamous? Yeah. It's great. Fucking hilarious. Did you, uh, oh, the other thing is uh, I also opened for Kurt Metzger. That was the other one this year. Okay. And then uh, just the other stuff I've been doing is just like Nathan Clemens gives me a lot of like headlining show or sets on his shows. So it's like doing like a half hour and stuff like right now. And I'm trying to like get into featuring at like the Laughing Tap and the Improv. Mm-hmm. I gotta, I, I gotta make an effort to go back up to Skyline too, because I that was the first club that ever gave me in weekends. Chicago. No, Skyline's uh, Appleton. Oh, okay. So I gotta, I gotta start going back up there because I got a new GM, and so I was kind of phoning it in for a little bit, which is shameful that mm-hmm. I wasn't as going as hard as going on up there. It really seems like a lot of times you just have to be to ten- ten- like show tenacity and just ask to be on a show. Um, yeah, but obviously you have to be like the. 
the um producer, the promoter needs to know you're funny. Yeah, yeah. You, you have know? you have to prove them right for like believing that you can do it and stuff. Mm. So you have to pay it off all the time. Like that'll be embarrassing. Has there ever been a time when somebody vouched for you to like open for somebody else and you bombed? No one's vouched for me and I haven't paid it off, but I have vouched for people and then they've kind of fucked up or they didn't take it seriously or, you know, um, I, I've had bookers hit me up about some people that I know being like, hey, is this person like going through something right Damn. now? Because this is a, this is an issue. And I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. Like, yeah. I was like, I, like when those kind of things happen and this is going to sound like really cold. I won't go out of my way to tell somebody that, like, oh, this person can't do a show or this person shouldn't do a show, but I will not help them either. Like, it's just, like, it's just that way where I'm, like, you got to make your own way. You got to, like, because I I wouldn't, if I was, if I was constantly making mistakes, I wouldn't expect, like, AJ or David or Ton to go out of their way and try to help me, you know? And, like, so, like, I, and, like, it's just the same way. Like, I don't think any of them would want someone to be, like, hey, like, Throw my name out there, and then yeah. they go up there, and they just fuck up. And of it's course, because like then it's like you, you don't want to. You're ruining your reputation. Exactly. You so. unless you're ready, you can't put yourself out there. Yeah. You just, just 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 wait till you're ready. I mean, this I game look, takes a long ass time. I That's what I'm learning. I thought I was funny. Every friend group I've ever been in, I've always been the funniest person. Every classroom I've ever been in, I was always the funniest guy. I thought I was funny. <laughs> I tried us tried stand up. This shit is tough. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, so there, there, uh, my, I don't know if you've met my friend Laura, who's been coming around to like, uh, to a bunch of like shows and like open mics and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, she goes to the improv a lot. Uh, we went to high school together. The one I think I've seen her with glasses, right? Yeah, the glasses. Mm-hmm. She's like, the, she's a short one. She's got like the sleeve tattoos mm-hmm. and stuff. So, okay, so you have seen her. She, um, she started hanging out because she was at a show that I was doing at the improv. Um, she, it was actually, uh, it, it was Nick Coletti. Oh, yeah, that's another one. I <laughs> think Nick Coletti was another show that I did. Um, and she was there, and she, like, messaged me on Facebook and was like, hey, you did great at the show. I'm like, are you are you here? Like, I was like, what do you, I was like, why, didn't you, why don't you say anything? She's like, well, I've seen you a couple times here, but this was a good one. And I was like, why have you not said something? Like, I would totally come say hi or whatever. It's not like we we have to just get locked in the green room and we can't come out. I was like, I'll yeah. come out and, like, talk to you or hang out or something like that. And so then she kind of was like, she she kind of was going through some stuff. And I'm like, well, do you want to come to these open mics? Do you want to come hang out with us? And she became really good friends with Reagan right away. Because, like, uh-huh. you know, it's like girl power shit. And, girl power yeah. shit. So, you know, like they're all like, like all like now she's just kind of hanging out with all of us. And it's like super fun. But she was also hanging out with another girl that we went to high school with. And this uh-huh. girl said something to her about like, oh, you're going to love my friends. They're so funny. And Laura said she just sat there and listened to these people suck and not be hilarious at all. Like, it was a comedy show or just, no, like, hanging out with just, them? just people hanging out at a bar. Well, you've been around comedians. Like, these are people who study the art of humor. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know what Laura, I'm saying? Laura has no interest in doing comedy or public speaking, and she mm-hmm. was just, like, hanging out with you guys ruined my sense of humor. Because <laughs> like, she doesn't think she's funny anymore. No, she doesn't think anybody Anybody's else is funny, funny. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> hang out with me in Vegas yelling over each other and she's like giggling at that but now it's like you got other dudes that are like that's what she said at a bar and she's like meh just yeah. like, so we spoiled a non-comic also into thinking other people suck that's another thing I've noticed about comedy you never want to um, go after somebody who's really funny or somebody who bombed because there will be some times when you're, you've been doing this for eight years I'm yeah. a rookie you're a vet but Explain this to me. Why is it that there's some times when I can do a set at one club, one bar, everybody's laughing at everything I'm saying, at everything I say, it hits. Then, okay, okay, this is a good set. I'm going to work on it again. I'm going to go to the next club and do the, sit, uh, do the same thing, do the exact same set. Crickets. Yep. Crickets. What is that? There could be a couple things. There could be the one thing of, like, if it's brand new, you're, like, you can tell when somebody's really excited about something brand new that they want to talk about. Like, like they have like a new take on Joe Biden or something like that. And you're like, oh, I'm going to say this. And you have like this little like you have like this little sparkle in your eye when you're saying it. And it comes off really authentic and you're really excited. And then you're like, now I know it works. And you might deadpan it more than you think you are because you're like, OK, this worked once. And now you have the confidence. But that little spark went away. Oh. So you kind of got to keep like reigniting that fire. It's a spark. And that's what I've realized. Like um, this was actually yesterday. I did a joke that didn't go over yesterday. Um, I said, 
I was like, um, some women like talking during sex, and I was like, I can't talk during sex because it's distracting. I can't fuck you and talk to you at the same time. It's like rubbing your head, patting your stomach, and then, and then, um, I I said. If you can't get me involved in talking during sex, because I'll say some shit that fucks up the mood. Like, you can't ask me some shit like, um, do you like that, baby? Or uh, tell me something dirty, because I'll say shit like your kitchen. Like, yeah. objectively, that's funny. That should fly. Like, the structure of comedy and everything, that's a good punchline. Like, tell me something dirty, your kitchen. Yeah. You know? Like, or, like, that's like the intersection like, of being a comic and being a smart. It's like, I gotta, I gotta take a flyer on the obvious funny joke instead of just being serious about something mm-hmm. for a minute. And then I watched, I, I recorded that set. I looked back at it and then I noticed it was 100% attitude why people didn't laugh. Like, I was just kind of saying it like it happened in real life. Yeah. But I wasn't performing it. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm it's, saying? Yeah, there's a difference between performing it or saying your jokes and selling your jokes. Like, there's a big difference in that. I actually was talking about this kind of the same concept with uh, with Aaron Morris last night because she was sitting at the bar and she was saying that, you know, she doesn't want to come out and do old bits again and stuff like that. But she's also a newer comic too. And like, I was like, well, there's also a thing that you can do if you have to do a joke that you've done a bunch of times, just doing little tune-up things here and there. You know, it's like you might not need an oil change, but you might need a tune-up or something. So you just go into just go into an open mic if you don't have something new and take a joke that you've done before like a hundred times and just try to tell it differently. Like do a different inflection on different words or something like that. That's also working on something because you could have a joke that you really believe in that goes up right before you and bombs. And then the, the tone of the room is like, oh, yeah, you can go. You're not going to go up there and be like, hey, everybody, how's it going? Like, they're not going to be on board with that. So if you just go there and be like, oh, f- man, how's it going? Like, you know, you can say the same things and say it in a different way. So what happens if somebody goes up before you and bombs? I feel like that kind of it doesn't ruin your set, but it's, it ruins the temp, the tempo of your set. Because f- not everybody's not there. They're like, oh, they're reminded that these comics, a lot of them aren't going to be funny. So they're not really paying attention to the next guy that just is following who just bombed. I, I think that's on the host, actually, unfortunately, to have to kind of reset the room. Like, you, you almost re-rack like it's pool. Like, you got to re-rack this, and we got to get this back to the way it was. Thanks for watching the Greatly Destined podcast. We will resume shortly. There's a, there's a difference between also like with energy. Some people think that like energy means volume or something, but there's just like an energy of being positive or, you know, like being optimistic about the show. And, you know, you don't have to acknowledge, like everyone knows if something went wrong or something mm-hmm. was weird on a show. And, you know, if you just go there and be like, oh, okay, well, you know, let's, let's keep it going. You that's know, why, just, that's and, why a lot of comics sometimes when somebody bombs before them, it's kind of a shitty thing to do. But it's kind of saving your own set, yeah. Because they just put temp- put down the temperature, put down the um the energy of the room, right? But what they would do is like, as the comic who just bomb get o- gets off the stage, they make fun of the set, like yeah. how that was like a terrible set, and, and then they just clown it, and like you're, it just happens. It's comedy; you're supposed to know that and move on. I do think that there is a thing though, too, like with like I mean, I I, I notoriously like I'm probably talking out of my ass because I do do this sometimes, but it's like shitting on the person that went before you. Um, it doesn't always ingratiate you with everybody else either, especially if it's, like, at an open mic, unless it's, like, somebody makes a big no-no. Like, Vegas, like, his second open mic, he said a slur on stage. It it was the C word for Chinese people. Uh, Yeah, and we all were like, dude, what the fuck? You cannot fucking do that, dude. Like, that was... And, like, we all kind of spanked him for that one. Like, it was just like, no, bad, bad, bad Vegas. Like, it was like... Bad Vegas. <laughs> we did that to him. And he, he took it to heart because he didn't want everybody... Like, he has good intentions. He yeah. didn't want everybody to hate him. So, like, he was like, oh, like, I shouldn't do that. Because he's like, that's just the way me and my guys talk, talk you know? Mm. It's like... He's like, okay, but it's like, but a room full of strangers don't strangers, know... Strangers, you gotta from. create a... Uh-huh. Yeah. That rapport. And, like, they gotta know Mark Vegas is a good dude. He's when he says the chink he doesn't yeah. mean oh i hate asians he's just right he was yeah he, he making was kind a, of making mm, a joke and just making just, jokes trying to be light and funny uh-huh so yeah that was that was kind of, one of those things but it's like yeah it's also like but if something goes that far off the rails i mean like we have like we have straight up like any 
white dude who just says the N word. Like we're like, yeah, no, nah, the mic's gone now. You don't. Get <laughs> the mic's anymore. gone now. You don't get that way. No, no, no. Like, we were taking this away from you now. Like no, no, no. Because now it's <laughs> trying like, to get no, all of us in trouble. Now, now, now you gotta go talk to the fucking tribunal, and you gotta go run the gauntlet and hope to God Tan or Niles or Eric doesn't kill you. When so when a white person says the N word like publicly in front of other people, the other white people look at it like, fuck, man, you're gonna get us in trouble. Don't no, say that. I will legitimately laugh because I'm thinking of the outcome. <laughs> like it's. Uh, like this guy's it, life is it, over. It, yeah, it's like, oh man, this How guy is stupid guy is of a done. white person. Do you have to be in two? Th- you've seen everything. Like you, you see what happens when people do it. That's why when and we you're were talking, still trying to like play around and dance with it. That's why when we were talking before, I straight up was like, it's like th- trying to sneak a fastball past a hitter. You're like. Mm-hmm. All right, like you could maybe do it, but honestly, most hitters are gonna be fastball hitters. Even so when like, as, not... for, as unfortunate as it is, that word is just so polarizing that even when you're not using it directly to a person, people get mad. Like we were just yeah. talking about how Rogan used it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's like out of context. Like I, I can understand it, but I can also be like, I don't like that you did it, but yeah. also I don't hate. I understand you for it. that you used it in context, and yeah. like you're paraphrasing somebody but it's like at the same time yeah you could have just said the n-word instead of saying the whole thing right, you right. know yeah. it's the same thing with being on stage as a comic is comedy harder for white people because you guys less you guys get less creative freedom no i don't think so you don't think so no um i i, I think i i do hate when white people are like you can't say anything uh, it's fucking bullshit you can say whatever the hell you want to as long as you make it very clear that you are coming from a place of trying to make people laugh and you're not yeah. being cruel like i mean i'm still i'm still a 90s kid i still say that shit's gay like i say shit like that all the time and i'm like i know i'm not supposed to hillary duff had a whole thing on the disney channel she's like mm-hmm. don't say it it's like well I don't don't say it. it might be it, comedy might not be harder for white people but white people definitely make it harder because <laughs> you guys I, are the ones that get offended the most I, well i mean not me <laughs> not you I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, the, I, but it's probably the guilt that's that we're supposed to that. we're supposed to be guilty but it's like are, are you, you don't have to we're all having anyways. fun here just let yeah that's what <laughs> godfrey did that at the improv I'm, he made a black joke that some of the white people didn't like it was like he was like come on don't let your white guilt cock block yeah. your fun like we're all having fun here just laugh you know what's funny I'm a black guy. I'm giving you permission. Laugh. Yeah. Like, you don't have to, you know. Be like, oh, well, should you be saying that? It's like, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> no one cares. Like, it's if it's funny, it's funny. It doesn't matter. Like, uh-huh. um, I do think that a, a good rule of thumb for a lot of white comics is go do black rooms, though. Because that'll really test if your personality plays with just anybody instead of being, on, at, like, Bremen. I personally... I don't like Bremen. Like, I like that Reagan hosts it. I liked when Gary and Elijah hosted it. I, I liked it when uh, Phil Davidson and Ryan Mason hosted it. Mm-hmm. It's it's the best mic. I hate that bar. It's the best room, yeah. I hate that fucking bar so much. Like, it's just that bar. It's just the, the hipsters that are there. I just, I don't like them. the energy is good at Bremen, that's the best. That's the, the best, best room. But, like, I fucking hate I hate the clientele. I hate the music open mic people later. They just, they bug me. They're all, they think that there are these high fucking artists and then like, they're like, oh, well, sometimes the comedy's bad. I'm like, yeah, I they probably think they're better than us. Like these artists and we're just these like this is actually probably, idiot jokesters. This is a good transition into what we were going to talk about. There was one time, this was uh, a few years ago when the Bucks were playing the Raptors and we were, we were definitely getting knocked out of the playoffs. This was game this was game five, I think, so we were on a two-game losing streak at this point. Uh, this is one uh, The Bucs hadn't lost back-to-back games that entire season, and this is the first time, like, the Raptors, Nick Nurse, they figured out how to stop Giannis. Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting there watching Giannis turn the fucking ball over, and it got to the point in the playoffs where I'm just like, motherfucker, at the bar, and this one dude who just was dressed ironically. like he, Ironically. He, was just ironic. he had, like, fucking, like, suspenders and a misfit shirt, and, you know, he had mutton chops, like he was a Civil War vet. Mm-hmm. And he just goes, why do you even care about a stupid sports ball game? And I'm like, because my fucking dad hugged me, that's why. How about that? Like, how about that? I grew up with a dad who would actually go outside and play basketball with me, okay? Like, my dad coached my, ba- my basketball team when I was a so kid. So you felt like he was hating on you? Well, he was. He was like, look at this guy caring about sports. And I'm like, look at you caring about politics. Your vote doesn't matter. Shut up. Like, it's just, <laughs> give a fuck. My vote for y- the All-Star game mattered more than your vote. Okay? Absolutely. So, <laughs> it can, probably changed the world more than I his can vote did, legally, too. I can legally vote 25 times a day for the NBA All-Star game. So, like, <laughs> Probably changed the world more than his vote did, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. The Bucks though, they were looking kind of... 
unimpressive last week. I, I mean, you know, everybody slips a little bit. It's fine. We're, you were still without without Chris Middleton. That's I mean, true. We got. I guess we should probably transition. The Bucks are my one true love. They are, <laughs> the Bucks are your one true love. I've loved that team since I was seven years old. <laughs> they are. You think really? Yeah. Oh wow. But well, I, I guess I mean I'm sure my white folks is crazy. <laughs> wrong one. Wrong one. That's no, my bad. No, that's, that's fine. Bad. There we go. There we go. There we go. Um, you deserve that. You no, des- been, not the white folks is crazy one, yeah. but you deserve the applause one because being a Bucks fan since you were seven. Hey, uh, that's when they were trash. Well, it was 97. And then we had, well, but we got Ray Allen and we had Glenn Robinson. You know, it was pretty sick. You know, we having those guys come up. You know, we had the light them up, light them up, you know, intro thing. Uh huh. That was, that did was. Did you go awesome. to a lot of games? My dad did take me to a lot of games because the Bucks were terrible and it was. It cheap. cost like 725. It, yeah, it was fucking cheap, dude. Like it was, it cost more to park than it did to go see a game. I bet, you, I bet that's probably facts. I loved it. I loved. Uh, I loved the Bradley Center shitty nachos. I didn't care how stale the yellow chips were. They were. I, See, I loved I'm it. from Chicago, and here's the thing I like about cities like Milwaukee. I went to a Bucks game. I took a girl to a Bucks game a couple weeks ago, and I spent twenty one dollars on the tickets. Two tickets for twenty one dollars, and the Bucks are the, one of the best teams in the NBA right now. They won a championship two years ago, and they're probably championship contenders right now as we speak. And I bought two tickets for twenty one dollars. Yes, they were in the third section, but that is impressive. Well, they were doing that was a special. <laughs> you can't promo. do that in Chicago. That was a special. Promo. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was a special promo that they were running. The Bucks were doing like a nineties pricing because they, they were doing the purple jerseys once in a while again this year from like the early two thousand. Those are so sexy. So yeah, I, I love. I I have my Bobby Portis one pre ordered right now. I got my Bobby Portis pre, uh, purple jersey. Purple they, gotta Portis. Go back. they should go back to those colors. Those are sad. green and purple. That's nice. I do. I do miss the green and purple now, but like even. even even like I was saying to you before, I despise the 1982 Milwaukee Brewers. Like I like the ball and glove logo, mm-hmm. like the, the M and the B that makes the ball and glove. That's a brilliant logo. I think I will stand behind. That is the best logo in professional sports. Oh yeah. That logo is so good. Like it's, it's simple. It's just an M and a B Milwaukee Brewers and it's a baseball glove. It's so good. That is the best fucking logo. The Arizona Diamondbacks had a good one too, where it was a D and a B backwards that made a snake head. So it basically looked like how my hands are. I love the Brewers. Um, the, the best thing about the Brewers is the stadium. Yeah. I remember like 10 My cousins have always lived in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee area. They live in um, Bayside? Bay, Bay, Bayview? Bayview or Baytosa. Uh, well, isn't isn't uh, that like a little thing like well, Wauwatosa, Bayside? Uh, oh, if it's Bayside, then maybe. Oh, Bayside's yeah. That's not, like a nickname yeah. they have going yeah, on. Bayside's but, yeah, they live over there in that area. And I would always, we used to come down here all the time, and you coming into Milwaukee, you drive past this Miller's Park at the yeah. time, and then it just had these big, beautiful, these big, beautiful letters in yellow font, Miller's Park, and it was just lit up on it. the sign. I was like, that's a vibe. I miss it the way that they did it. Like, when we were in the playoffs, we used to call it the keg, because, you know, it was Miller Park, Miller mm-hmm. Beer, the keg was popping, you know, we had it when... And now it's it's American Family Field, and I'm what just like, the hell it's is that? so fucking soulless. No, I mean soulless. They always change it to some soulless ass name. It's too. just it's whoever bids for it the most. You know, and I was so mad because you know they, they started calling it the Am Fam, and I immediately no, don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, they're, they're, trying, they're, trying, they're trying to abbreviate it like, oh, it's the Am Fam. Don't do that. I was like, if we ever hit a four run home run, I'm gonna lose my goddamn mind when somebody gets on the other and go a grand slam at the, the Am, Am Fam. fam. I'm like, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> don't do that. Don't uh, I do did that. like so. Uh, you probably don't remember this because the Bucks were terrible. This is back when you were still a Bulls fan. When that- we had, uh, uh, we had like all the different international players on the team. You know, we had like Andrew Bogut, who was from Australia. We had Carlos Delfino on the team. We had Ursan Ilyasova. You say you Andrew know, Bogut? Yeah, and mm-hmm. we had uh, we had Zaza Pachulia. Like we had like all those guys like on this team, and. We called it the International House of Jump Shots when it was the Bradley Center because we had so we had the most um, European, uh, European, and like just all over. Uh, Luke Richard and Bob Mute was on the team. He was from Bob Cam- Mute. Yeah, he I remember was, him. Yeah, he was from Cameroon. He averaged like eight points per game. He was terrible. Um, he was fun, but like he was guys not a great. He was a starter. Butt cheeks. You guys had yeah. Monte Ellis for a little. We had him for. I have an authentic Monte Ellis jersey because I was really hoping he was going to resign, and he fucking dipped so hard. Really. Yeah, uh, he got yeah. the fuck out of here. You weren't, you're not a cute kid anymore, man. Uh, that's that's. He got the fuck out of here. He you're was a like, grown ass man. It's like I, fuck you. I got things to do. I have you my grown ass man. I have my Monte Ellis jersey hanging up in my bedroom. It is kind of funny that it's up there because like one of my friends like walked in like because I my bathroom is attached and he went the wrong way so he went to go to the bathroom. He walked into my bedroom. 
And he saw, he's, he's like, oh, you have an old school Brooke Lopez jersey? I'm like, you didn't look at the name. That says Ellis on the back. That's a Monte Ellis jersey. Like, they have the same number, right? Yeah, number, yeah, they're both number 11. Um, that, it's even funnier that I'm kind of fat and I was wearing a number 11 jersey because those ones make you look so much fatter. Like, you it's think just, because it's just a single, it's just, yeah, yeah, and then you just skinny. the one probably is like yeah. spread, you push yeah, it out. Yeah, you just got skinny ones <laughs> on your back and it's just <laughs> emphasizing how fat you are. That's like, fucking <laughs> hilarious, man. Um, no, I mean, I love the Bucks though. They are, uh, I mean, I think I had them picked at the beginning of the year. I was like, oh, it's going to be Bucks Warriors finals. That's what I had picked last year too. And honestly, I still think that it would have been Bucks, uh, Bucks Warriors last year had Chris Middleton not jammed his knee in Chicago. I would agree with that. So, I mean, I thought that we would have beat them. You know, we, we, I mean, we would have beat the Bulls handily, and then we would have, I thought we would have beaten Boston. Um, we took them to seven games without him, so we exactly. definitely would have done that in, like, five. Yeah, and, I mean, Chris Middleton, up until this season now, has had almost identical numbers as Jason Tatum through his career. Tatum's younger. He's going to get better. You know, uh, Middleton's kind of on his probably last contract when the new one comes up. Is like, he being a punk sitting out this long with the, with his wrist? Or you like this, I uh, think they're letting the, him rest is I, a good idea? I would like an update on what's going on because I really like Chris Middleton and I really want him back in the uh, the lineup. They're not giving us many updates. I know, and they didn't do this with Brooke Lopez last year, and the whole thing was like, and then we held him out. He had back surgery like in December, and you're like, yo, what the fuck? Like, they were saying, like, oh, it was back spasms. And then Brooke Lopez had back surgery, and he came back in April, and he played, like, five games, and then he was, like, eligible for the playoffs. This is the latest update that um, CBS, CBS Sports has posted. Middleton, due to his wrist, remains unavailable for Wednesday's tilt versus the Knicks. Middleton has been assigned to the G League, few times of late to get in some practice and seems to be drawing closer to his season debut. There's no firm date for Middleton's return, but his next opportunity comes Friday against the Lakers. I said, uh, I, I, after we got midway through November, I, I think I said, uh, I think I said it to Reagan. Um, cause she's been trying to come out and watch more games with us. I said to her, I'm like, I think December 10th is the date that he's going to come back. Mm. They're going to try to get him a couple games before the big Christmas game. Because, I mean, that's the big day for the NBA. Like, the first half of the season is Christmas Day. You have the big the big rival games and everything are usually on Christmas Day. You know, you, they usually do, like, Brooklyn against the Knicks. You usually got Lakers, Clippers, or something like that. Or it used to be, like, Lakers, Boston. Now we got Bucks, Who do we Boston. play on Christmas again? The Bucks play Boston. Boston. And that's the first game against Boston since game Here? seven. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we're in Boston. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I could look at that. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that they want to get Chris Middleton back into the rotation. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm still in November on the schedule. Um... No, we're away. We're in Boston. Fudge. Yeah, I don't have a problem. Yeah, with that. it's Christmas. T- Obviously, they want TD Garden's fucking tough. They to have play more st- more seats. They want to sell it out. Well, yeah. The league wants to make money. I mean, they're going to make money regardless in that game. Um, that's going to be. They'll I, make I more think, if it's in Boston. Though. I think a lot of NBA fans are going to watch that game. That's going to be a highly televised, and that's also not like a 10 a.m. game either. I think we have like a 2 p.m. or something like that. Like we have like a kind of prime time Christmas day. Because, like, we also had that last – oh, it's 4 p.m., so it'll be 3 p.m. Our, no, I think NBA.com – I think the Bucks app actually goes on what our time is. Yeah, I don't know if too many people watch or watch the 4 o'clock games on Christmas. I do. <laughs> I watch well, them all. I'm <laughs> watching them all. <laughs> you're a big-time NBA fan, but the casual, yeah. they watch the later ones at, like, 7 or 8. Yeah. Who's playing that one? Probably Lakers. Probably I'm Golden sure. State or something like that. Like, they usually have that. But yeah, I was they thinking want Los Angeles to be good so bad. You know what? And I've said that like while LeBron gets towards uh, the scoring title because he's gonna break Kareem's record. Um, I, it's just I don't want to fucking watch this dog shit team play every fucking night on TNT and and then you have to listen to Charles Barkley be like, "Well, the Lakers ain't no damn good." Like he's got to like <laughs> listen to that shit like constantly. And then Shaq's like, "The Lakers are a good team. They always been a good team. I was a Laker one time. Kobe was a Laker." Uh, Kareem was a Laker, and the, the Lakers are a good organization. And he's like, man, they ain't no goddamn good team those coming are, out. Those <laughs> are some characters, right? I, know, I love the, uh, the uh, TNT. Uh, inside the NBA, LeBron's I could just. LeBron's very efficient. LeBron, no. LeBron's one of the most efficient players I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> earn it, earn it. I'm going to smack him. Earn it, I'm going to smack him. <laughs> Can you do an Ernie Johnson? <laughs> well, I'm Ernie Johnson. Uh, this is a <laughs> white guy. Uh, white guy. <laughs> I don't know. What's macaroni and cheese sound like? That's. <laughs> 
Oh my god! I, I have said my favorite thing that ever happened on uh, Inside the NBA was uh, Charles Barkley was going off. Uh, it was before Charles Barkley had Twitter. I don't even know if he has Twitter now. But he was going off because Kim Kardashian was pissed off that somebody made a fake Charles Barkley account and said that Kim Kardashian had a big ass. And they were cutting to a commercial, and they're like, dun, 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 dun. and he's like, hold on, I got to say something. I, was, I was want you to know right now that somebody done said that I said that Kim Kardashian got a big ass. I ain't never said that. She do be gotten a big ass, though, but I ain't never said <laughs> He it. said this on he TNT? Was, dude, I was like, Emmy, give him an Emmy right now. I this think is, they do have some Emmys. Oh, they, they have do. multiple. But I'm like, that, that should have secured it right there. It's like, this isn't even sweeps week. No one cares. Like, Honestly, <laughs> Kenny Smith, Charles and, and Shaq, their basketball careers are still better than their TV careers. Yeah. But Kenny Smith, like, he is a, a TV personality more than anything now, I feel like. I when I think of Kenny Smith, I think of TNT before yeah. his basketball. Right, yeah. Before like, his basketball career. Charles Barkley his is TV a, career has surpassed his basketball career. Um, do you do you know what, the, like, have you ever watched the beginning of the year when they do the thing, they do uh, the game Who He Play For, and they take, like, like, kind of players like Dante DiVincenzo who floats around the league or mm-hmm. whatever. You know, they'll take, like, a player that's, like, kind of, like, an unknown or whatever, and they ask the question, Who He Play For?, and and you, I forgot who it was one. They one roast time. them. No, they just they just try to figure out what team is this guy on. Who where he he's moving unknown. Through. So, yeah, he's like kind of like under the radar, unknown, or he's like a role Always player. Always moving something. from team to team. He's like a role player or something like that, like a second or third year player that got traded as like a you know a throwaway guy in a you know a blockbuster trade at the deadline, and they have to like figure out where this guy went. And Shaq just this like this year was like I don't even care who they play for. Because I, I ain't gonna know he played for the Kings. They ain't no good. I don't watch him. And it's just, it's just <laughs> so funny. Like they're like he's just like Shaq's. Like I don't care if your team's not. What good. is like, the yeah. team in the NBA that you like forget is a team? Uh, the Magic. <laughs> the Magic. I, no, uh, the because Orlando Magic. I, I I I was in high school when the Dwight Howard craze was going. When Dwight that Howard was the was last time them. I remember that, and it went to the finals in two thousand ten nine yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to forget them because they were also playing against the Lakers. Wait, did they go to the finals or am I tweaking? They went to the they went to the finals. They lost to the Lakers in nine or ten. Yeah, two thousand nine. They yeah. were yeah. They were Eastern Conference Finals every year. Uh, they were uh, and then LeBron just fucking and now that took motherfucker's over. playing in Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, he called out Shaq. Shaq was like roasting him for playing in Taiwan. It was like I don't give a damn. You scored triple double. It's still Taiwan, like you know. And he was yeah. on his ass. In and, and then Dwight Howard called out Shaq. He was like, dude. Like you're always constantly hating on people. Like I'm, he said, I'm 37 years old and I'm 260 pounds in like the greatest shape of my life. It was like when you were my, when you were 20, 37 years old, you were like 350. <laughs> so you were out of shape. You were trash. People just kept you in the league because they respected you as Shaq. Yeah, you know. So it's like it's the same. You very well could have been that dude in Taiwan, which your big ass out out of shape. You're not even in shape. Well, Dwight Howard's got a he's got a Hall of Fame career when he finally retires. Like he's he's got a nice career. He has a ring, so he's going to yeah. be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Well, I don't even think he would have needed a ring to be a Hall of Famer with that. I mean, Charles I mean, Barkley. May have. Charles Barkley's a Hall of Famer. He doesn't have a ring. Charles Barkley has done more than Sha- uh, Dwight, though. I guess. I mean, but you know, if you're quantifying, I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know what happened to Dwight? The game evolved and left him behind. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can't, he's a post player, post dominant player. Look at all the bigs nowadays. Yeah. They're like stretch they're, fives. They're stretch yeah. fives. Like, you know, as soon as, if you're a one trick pony, people are going to catch on to that. And I'm sure he can still be efficient, grab you rebounds, like score in the paint, but that's not what's going to win you championships anymore when the person he has to guard is moving like. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Durant. Well, and, and like, the, and uh, the other thing too is uh, Dwight Howard could never get out in transition like Giannis can, and like du- uh, like Kevin Durant can. In Taiwan, like he can. <laughs> yeah, he, oh, of course, he can just steamroll those fuckers. Like that's fine, but like, um, but no, like I was to say, like with the with the Bucks though, like I'm just like it's so hard to pass judgment on where we're sitting this year because I'm like I'm like excited for every game because I'm just like hell yeah, like watching Giannis is an absolute treat. treat. It's it's like I mean we're never gonna get this again. Like this is so fun watching this guy. Victor Wembanyama, yeah. maybe. Well, we're not gonna get him. Like, well, like he's not gonna be in. He's not gonna be on my team. The Imagine Bucks. how cool that would be if like somehow they make that happen. Yeah, the Bucks are gonna be too good to be able to draft him. Like he's gonna end up going to fucking like Indiana or something like yeah. that. And actually, I don't think Indiana's even that bad this year. Is that um, the team you think of when you like a team you forget that exists? No, because you, Reggie Miller, man. That's I, true. So it's hard to forget about them. Um, 
The Knicks are. I was gonna say that the Knicks are so bad. They've been so bad. They've been forever. mediocre. But the the Knicks are exactly like what the Bucks were, where they're like a seven or eight seed, and they just get their asses kicked in the playoffs. Um, mm-hmm. I I don't know if there's a team that I necessarily forget. It's got to be a San Antonio would probably, and that's really? also, that's also hypocritical of me to say because it's like okay after like Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili and uh, uh, fucking. Uh, uh, Tim Duncan, after they all retired, it's like, yeah, they weren't as good, but they also had fucking Kawhi after that. So it's like, I'm still for me, like, it's the magic. I know they had Dwight, they had Shaq in the early 90s, but it's like <clears throat> Jameer Nelson, they had yeah, uh, Rashad but who the fuck Lewis. is Jameer Nelson? <laughs> it's like, let's uh, like, like, that's what I'm saying. These are these are some of their best players, but in the grand scheme of these, they're nobody. They had exactly. DJ Augustine, DJ, for a, oh, he was decent, rec league superstar DJ Augustine. He's my height. <laughs> is he really? He's 5'7. He's a little, fucker. no way. Yeah, yeah, DJ Augustine's little as hell, man. DJ Augustine was hooping on the Bulls for a minute, yeah, yeah. Uh, rec league superstar DJ Augustine. Um, Oh, this uh, uh, this is a fun thing that me and uh, you, I don't think you've ever met Ryan Graham, but like we were, he texted me this last night. I, he, I'm pretty sure he was drinking when he. He's texted five eleven. He's five eleven. God, still damn it. fucking short though. Fuck him, dude. Sporting I'll take NBA. I'll take him in the post. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. Um, I'll I'll ask you this. I'll I'll flip the interview question onto yeah. you here, uh, and I'll just ask it the way Ryan Graham sent it to me. Um. Okay, he's bitching about women refs. That's pretty funny. Mm. He okay. Uh, he sent me this at uh, ten sixteen p.m. Could a team of all white NBA players make the NBA finals? So we tried to make the the all white superstar. Oh, roster. I saw that, and it's really sad how bad it is. It's, okay. it's like go ahead and show me. This is what he gave me. He gave me uh, Luka Doncic, Tyler Hero, Laurie Markkinen, uh, Nikola Jokic, and Zubak. And he's like, Zubac. And then, and then Zubac had a good game the other night, and everyone's like on Zubac's dick right now. Oh, you're now. talking about of all time and just this? No, no, just active players right now. I mean, because if you're going to start putting Larry Bird and shit on there, like, okay. like, But, like, no, we're you talking. You could probably make the – they'll probably go decent into the playoffs, but they'll probably still won't beat the current championship team. They're going to fundamentally take – so I said, like, I guess you got to put Duncan Robinson on there. Uh, Steven Adams, honestly, I would put over Kevin Love. Steven Adams, because he's playing on Memphis yeah. right now, and he's playing pretty well. Of course, I'm going to give some love to Pat Connaughton and Grayson Allen. And I was like, does, does Brooke Lopez count as white? No. Oh, what are they? Aren't they Spain? Yeah, the guy, I mean, Lopez is definitely a Spanish name. If It depends. If they're from Spain, you're white. If you're from, like, Mexico. I don't and think all he's Mexican. He's, he, I mean, he's born in America. He went to Stanford. It doesn't, if he's from Spain, he's white. Okay. Well, anything so else, he's not. I'm kind of, I, I, okay, I'll go. I was like, because otherwise I'll put Yusuf Nurkic on there instead. I'll, I'll take him. I'll put Nurkic in there, but he's hurt constantly. We got like C.D. Osman, uh, you know. You got you got uh, Demontis Sabonis. Like that doesn't sound like that sounds like you guys could have done a, a lot better. Well, white people. What the? <laughs> I'm saying not Josh not Giddy? white people. I'm saying you guys that made the lineup. I feel like there's a lot better white people in the league right now than that. Well, I mean, besides Luca, Hero, Laurie Markkinen, Jokic. I mean, that's kind of like that's like the that's no like, good white point guards you can put up there. Luca, Luca's the point guard. Oh shit, I'm tweaking. Yeah, it's like that. Luca's the best point guard. You'd use you you'd you'd use Luca. I mean, would he be like? To. I'm saying would he be like your face? Oh yeah, absolutely. Lu- I mean, Luca and Jokic could probably do something. Um, yeah, that's kind of that's. So you wouldn't want to keep him as a two? No, because I would. I, Tyler Hero would be my two. That's fair. He, he'd be my white two. That's fair. White two. <laughs> hey man, don't sleep. These white players are getting better. No white people were evolving. <laughs> They're better, but I will say it's the it's the European ones. Yeah, of course. Because they've been they they've been playing professionally since they were like nine. Yeah, because <laughs> they, they got nothing else, dude. It's either, it's either that or make. You know why? Because there's no they don't mix school with sports over yeah. in Europe. If they notice, like, hey, that kid has potential, they take them out of they they put them in like a no, they still go to school. But like they they they're trained separately, yeah, and they're basically trained and they're they're molded into this professional yeah. athlete to represent their country, and they because do that. they spot that oh shit this kid has potential at basketball, right. 
Let's take them out of this school, put them in a special school. And they do that. And uh, make them a professional. The NBA is starting to do that, too, with uh, a lot of, like, their um, the Africa stuff that they're doing. Like, they're trying Same thing to, with Africa, They're yeah. trying to build, like, decent stadiums and, like, centers to, like, make, like, to take Bro. a lot of people in Africa and, like, turn in them into. In 30 like, years, the, next... the whole league is just going to be African. I mean, fucking. If they I, keep doing that. You know what? If the league rules, I'm going to keep. Well, I don't care. I don't care where we get the talent from. A- it's sick. Athletic potential amongst Africans, if you just give them the resource. Yeah. Like, just, there's going to do. The biggest take... thing is nutrition, honestly. If you're going to get that, you just got to make sure that they're fed right and their bodies are taken care of, which is fucked up that we're like, yeah, you got to make sure these athletes are taken care of. It's like, I got to take care of everybody. But like, you know, if the NBA is making their investment, because like all the uh, the baseball teams, they have like the Dominican academies and stuff like all the Latin American Mm -hmm. countries. And it's so big there because they can play outside all year long. So like that's that's a big thing, and then there's also the the um, the, the reflex thing with like um, Venezuelans. Why so many shortstops come from Venezuela? It's because they play on those really terrible fields, and like you know the ball hits like a ground ball hits like a fucking rock that's in the middle of the field, and like they just learn how to like catch yeah, it. Yeah, adversity. They just get that whole thing. It's mostly like these guys protecting their teeth the entire time, and like they just learn like they're just better because. We have these they perfectly, have more adversity. We have these, yeah, we have these perfectly manicured fields up here. Like, I mean, minor league stadiums are like goddamn cathedrals and stuff. And then it's like down there, they're just playing in like dirt patches. And those and little stuff. things make you weaker, I'm and sure, then, yeah. Yeah, it's like, because we're, you know, you got soft hands up here and stuff. Mm-hmm, and then it's like, definitely. also we focus on, you know, going to college and stuff. And down there, they're like, nope, this is the way out for my entire family if I get good at this thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's why, like, I, I mean... I know people bitch that they're like, oh, my God, there's so many foreign players in the MLB. Fucking who cares? The product is better. I don't care. Then get. We need to make better Americans then. Mm-hmm. That's the same mentality of people who grew up in the hood. That's why there's so many people who grew up in the hood in the NBA and the NFL. Like, Basketball's a sport you can practice way by out. yourself. Mm-hmm. They can, you, it's like you, know, you don't need a, a mom or a dad to go outside and play basketball with you. You can go practice by yourself. Exactly. And it's super cheap, too, because you all you need is a fucking ball. A ball and a hoop. Yeah. And – Parks have hoops. And same thing with football. Yeah. That's why the poorest people tend to play those two games and the yeah. richest people tend to play like baseball, baseball and yeah. hockey and Baseball's all that shit where you need expensive. a bunch of stuff. Yeah. The pads and shit. It's uh-huh. so fucking so expensive. expensive. Skates are expensive. Cleats are expensive. To wrap this up, Milwaukee Bucks, one through ten. What's our chance of winning this year and why? Nine. Um the only thing is I'm gonna say health. Uh health is gonna be the biggest, uh the biggest obstacle. Um, you know, we're getting Joe Ingles back. It's going to be pretty cool that we're going to have him. Uh, Chris Middleton's going to be a 20 point per game player. I mean, I don't know if he'll finish that way, but if you're getting 15 to 20 points back mid season without making a trade, that's huge. Like that is so huge for the team that he's your second best player and he hasn't played a minute yet. Um, I'm not happy that there are trade rumors about Grayson Allen, um, to even flip it over. Like, they're talking about Jay Crowder for Grayson Allen. I don't like that. I don't like that, like, we're going to – that we're the second best team. We're a game and a half out of having the best record in the East, and we're talking about tweaking this roster. And I just feel like a trade for Grayson Allen, it, or like, to, to, like, Phoenix for Jay Crowder, is a move to make a move because we're already getting an athletic wing back. We're getting another uh, passer in Joe Ingles coming back, like a two-guard that can pass and stuff and kind of run the point if we need him to. Like, it's just when Middleton's back, it's going to push a lot of guys further back down the bench. And then Javon Carter played his way so well into the starting rotation. I don't know that he comes out of it. Like, I think that our starting rotation is going to be Drew Holiday at the point, and Javon Carter is going to run the two. And then when George Hill comes in for Drew Holiday, you're just going to slide Javon Carter over to the one. And all you're going to do is have Hill in there for defense. Uh Grace Nallen, his role will be slightly reduced. Um, did you see that Grace Nallen actually is shooting? He has the best three-point percentage last month for a guy who uh, took over 35 three-pointers. No, I didn't see that. He shot 51% and shot over 35 three-pointers last uh, last month. Damn. He was number one in the league. And we're like, I mean, you have to put feelers out there to see what your players are worth if you're mm-hmm. going to make a trade midseason. But honestly, I don't think that until Chris Middleton, Giannis, and Drew Holiday play together for a minimum of 10 games together, all on the floor at the same time, that you can fairly assess what this team is. 10 games is one-eighth of the season. I think that's more than enough time to be like, all right, this is what we got, this is what we look like, and this is when things are flowing right, what this team can do. I think the Bucks are going to be the one or the two seed coming out of the East when it's all said and done. It's probably going to be us in Boston. In the Eastern Conference Finals? Uh, yeah. Well, no, I think it's going to be us in Boston, possibly 
depending on where we're jockeying for the spots, we might meet again in the semis. I think the team, what I think might end up happening is I think Atlanta is going to upset some people. I think Atlanta is really tough. I think that Trey Young made some massive strides, and that's the one team that bothers me uh, in the East. Mm -hmm. And it's because Drew Holiday can lock up any point guard in the league. He can lock them down. He did it to Luka the other night. Um, like he held Luca to 27 points and Luca was putting up like, what, like 36 and like almost averaging a triple double damn near drew holiday, locked him down for 27 points. If you want to call it locking him down, Trey young is the only one who averages like 35 points a game on drew holiday. That's a, that's a very difficult player for just drew holidays, uh, play style. So that's the one team that bothers me because I think that's the one time we're outmatched at one position. And then all they have is like guys like um, Clint Capella who can just be physical with Giannis. So we're going to need those points to come from somewhere else, and I'm hoping it's Chris Middleton. Mm -hmm. And then also there's Brooke Lopez who is shooting astronomically well from three, which is crazy that he found the fountain of youth again. (laughs) Our issue was we just couldn't – last year with the Celtics, we just needed extra points. That was in Middleton, and like nobody could fill in that void. Well, nobody could play isolation basketball and create their own shot. But then also, like I said this year, we just found out that Javon Carter can just do that. It's like he can he can take guys off the dribble, and he can do a little step back. He can hit these little floaters. He can take these out, these off balance shots where he keeps his legs under him and just like pops the ball. It's he's hitting shots. I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? Mm-hmm. And he he did say that he worked really really hard in the off season to be able to actually like like earn his spot because I think we all thought that. Javon Carter should have been playing in the the, uh, the semis against uh, the Celtics because George Hill wasn't shooting well. And we're like, just put anybody else in here, just anybody at all. And it was like Javon Carter, we're like, well, he plays dog defense. Like he is just, he he rips the ball away from people. Everyone was calling him the hurricane last year. Him and Drew Holiday are just like a fucking hurricane of hands. Every time anybody's got a ball, they trap guys so yeah. well, they're both quick. And then it's like, well, why aren't we playing him? And Coach Bud has done this several times and why people wanted Bud fired so much. Like, uh, when we were even going to, like, I think Coach Bud would have been fired had we not gotten past the Nets. You think? I think so. I think that he would have been gone. Um, and remember that series, Bobby Portis didn't play a minute in that series. And it was one of those things where, like, things were getting dire. We needed points. And we were just having basically six guys grind it out. It was, like... PJ Tucker was like the only bench guy. Oh, I remember PJ Tucker. Yeah, they were like they were they were the only ones me. grinding this shit out against the fucking the Nets. And because Kevin Durant's toe was on the line, we ended up winning that series. Yeah. Which was just <clears throat> luck. Our luck was a toenail. Like that was crazy. And uh Bud stuck around, but now this year Bud changed up the defense and he actually seems like he's put a lot of trust into guys like Javon Carter. And it's like that's very interesting that Bud isn't managing this the way he used to, and I think he might be more flexible come the playoffs. And if a guy isn't producing, I think Bud might actually switch it up and play a guy who he just has a hunch about instead of going by the numbers and playing Mm -hmm. it safe. Because that's why we lost to the Raptors in uh, 19 or 18 or whatever it was. I think it was 19 because it was we needed rebounding. We're just getting out-rebounded by Pascal Siakam. And we had Ursan Ilyasova and Robin Lopez sitting on that goddamn bench. And it's like, and Robin Lopez was fourth in the league in defensive efficiency in the inside the paint, and number one was Giannis, and number two was Brooke Lopez. We had we had three of the top four players defensively inside the paint, and one of them was just parked on the fucking bench. Yeah, and it's like, what are you doing? Like, just mix it up at some point. And I think Bud is more trusting of his team now, and that he will play players in the playoffs that deserve to be playing. And I think he's going to take season stats into consideration a lot more. But, I mean, ultimately the big thing with winning a championship is health. Mm-hmm. And health so. and putting that fucking ball in the goal. Well, that's mean, what we were lacking last year. Yeah, and, I mean. In the playoffs, again, at least. That was Middleton. And then, I mean, what do we have? We had Grace Allen and Pat Connaughton out there doing the same thing, trying to come off screens and shoot threes. And the Celtics were like, fucking shoot them. Just shoot them. <laughs> just, we'll just see what happens. And wow. we missed everything. So, I don't know. I, I think we're going to be They were fine. daring us. But let's hope we are fine. I would love to see another championship from Milwaukee. I'm trying to get down there. My Brady Street got turned up, you know. Have a little fun. That's only if the Bucks can win, you know, because I'm a win. bandwagon fan, and I would love to see them I want more win. bandwagon fans. <laughs> I would love to see them actually win as a champion, as a, as a fan. 
I love to see them become two time champions as a fan because the first time you guys won, I wasn't. I'll be honest, I wasn't exactly a fan, but I knew I was moving to Milwaukee, yeah. and I was like, this will be so cool if they actually win right before I move. Hey, I and cried. They did. I cried in front and of you all deserve, the comments. I cried in front of David Lewis and, you and deserve, AJ Grill. <laughs> and you you deserve to cry. Go ahead. It you, was you, you deserve that. It was years and years of pain. I it can was only imagine. It was buddy. Scott Williams. It was Scott Williams getting pulled off the fucking plane in 2001 because they wanted uh, the, he tested positive for what we don't fucking know. But he tested positive for a substance. They pulled our hype guy. He was basically our Bobby Portis. He was what? He uh, Scott Scott Williams was like our sixth man. He was like our hype guy. He was like he was like Bobby Portis. Yeah. He's the guy who got the fucking crowd into it. They pulled him off the plane. They said, "No, you can't play the next game. You're suspended because you pissed positive for something." And he never came back. They never said what it was. I mean, I'm sure somebody will fact check it and go fucking. Oh, it was like weed or something. Who gives a shit? He tested positive for something. They pulled him off the fucking plane. We end up losing. Iverson gets to go play the Lakers in the finals because that's what they wanted. They wanted yeah. Iverson, Shaq in the finals. That was bullshit. They fucked us. Like, the NBA fucked you us. You think that was um, deliberate? I think so. I mean, did you watch the documentary of the Tim Donahue? Uh, I, that, that ref that used to rig shit? I won't be surprised. There's a lot of... There's a lot of dirty shit dirty that's happened that and stuff. Like, I exactly. love the NBA, but they're, they I can't act like they haven't done dirty shit of to course. people and stuff. And of course. The way the the bigger Kings, markets, they the, make more money if they go to the finals. Chris Webber and the Kings got fucked over because they were like, no, we need this series to go to seven games. And they just started fucking calling fouls on the Kings when the Kings should have beat the Lakers. Wow. Like, there was all that dirty shit that they did to people, and you're like, you got to be fucking... It, like, it turned wow. into the WWE at a certain point. And it's like, it, I think the NBA is better now, but... At, at the same time, it was like it was all those painful things that happened, you know. Then the Bucks mismanaging things, the Bucks going out and trading Ray Allen for Gary Payton and thinking that Gary Payton wanted to stick around here. And then Gary Payton's like, I'm not sticking around Milwaukee, and he fucking left. You know, we we drafted Andrew Bogut. You know, Andrew Bogut had his arm explode because, uh, 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 what's his dick? Uh, got, what's under, his dick? <laughs> got underneath him. Like, he went up for a dunk, and the dude clipped him. Uh, Amari Stoudemire. Amari yeah. Stoudemire clipped him. He fell down. His arm went backwards. He broke his arm in, like, Jesus. six places. That was, like, we were eight games away from the playoffs. Like, we were eight games out from the season ending. We were in the playoffs, and Andrew Bogut's arm exploded, basically, on the court. It was like that Like that, that stadium was dead silent. Like, mm. hearing a seven-foot Australian man roll around on the ground screaming uh-huh. was, it's haunting. Like, all of those things that happened, it was like, you know, Monte Ellis leaving, uh, us trading for... Those are the rough days, you know? Us trading for J.J. Redick and him being pissed that he got traded to Milwaukee and J. Nobody, J. who's the fuck is trying to live here in Milwaukee? When right. they move here, who, where do you, where do they move to? Well, uh, like, where do they live, you think? I mean, Bobby Portis has bought a pretty high-end condo. Uh, the person who sold Bobby Portis' condo was on, on, on my show. Oh, really? Uh, the... The guy I just interviewed right before you? That rules. He was on the team that sold him. The, okay. Yeah, so let me not say he's like the individual yeah. realtor. But, yeah. But yeah, it's still fucking, yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. So, yeah, they, uh, but I mean, like, those, like, they, they'll find places. Milwaukee's not the worst place in the world to live if you find the right place. If you find the stuff. right place. And, um, like, but, yeah, I'm like, all those, all those shitty things, like, just knowing, like, every, every mismanagement this team had, the fact that the Bucks almost had to leave, then the NBA started fucking around because we had to get a new state-of-the-art stadium. Because Herb Cole, when he sold the team to Lazary and Edens, had a stipulation that the Milwaukee Bucks have to stay in Milwaukee. You cannot take them. And it was contractually obligated that you cannot. So they were going to take the – so if they could have, they would have taken them in 2016. If they would have had any other team, uh, any other ownership group that would have bought them and would have moved the team. Because Milwaukee doesn't have any freaking sports. <laughs> they would have just had baseball left, and, and that's because exactly. they're so close to Chicago. Right, and exactly what they said is they were like, you cannot move – this team, like Herb Cole made sure that his bucks stayed in this goddamn state. And I can't thank that guy enough for doing that for us because that was awesome that he did that and put that stipulation. Otherwise it would have voided the deal and it would have went reverted right back to Herb Cole or gone up for bid or something. No. So his, his thing was you do not sell this team and Lazary and Edens were like, we don't plan on moving the team out of Milwaukee. So that was cool that he found the right owners for this kind of thing. They did it, and then the NBA stepped in and said, well, the Bradley Center is old, and you have to get rid of it. It was built for hockey. It's not a state-of-the-art NBA stadium. And the bluff should have been, what about the Oracle Arena that Golden State plays in? That is an old fucking arena. And they they never did anything because they wanted to move us to Seattle. They wanted us going back, and they wanted the Sonics oh, back. Oh, Seattle Bucks? And, that would have been cool. Well, they would have been the Seattle Sonics again or something. Oh. They would have renamed them or something, or they would have been the, the Seattle something. And then the other one was Kansas City built in NBA 
ready stadium. Like they apparently, have apparently two new teams are they're trying to expand. Right, um, Mexico City, and yeah. I forgot what the other one is. It's probably Seattle. That would Seattle. probably be the other one. And so, like, I'll try to wrap this up quick, but I'm like, all those things, just knowing all that about the team and how we almost lost our box. Like, we always had, we had a Facebook page, like, save our box. Mm -hmm. Like, we had, like, all these things. And it's just all the players that we had that were just shitty or the bad years, the 16 win season that we had, Jabari Parker blowing out his ACLs, uh, you know, just all the things that went wrong for the box, you know, that we we're like, oh my God, we're never going to get over the hump. And then us getting that, that just all washed away the second mm. that fucking, uh, that we won the championship. I cried in front of all my friends and I immediately was like, bring back the fucking purple jerseys. I want the, <laughs> I want that green jersey you with the deer on the side of it. guys winning a championship, it reminds me of. I want um, the red jerseys back. I want the, I want the red, like the red and green Christmas looking shit. I want it all back right oh, now. Oh, the Christmas like, shit was ugly. But you guys winning a championship reminds me of when the Cubs won in 2016. That yeah. shit was fucking huge. Yeah, well, that People was a hundred and some years. Yeah, that was even ten times bigger. Yeah. But let's go ahead and wrap this up, though. Um, Andrew, let the people know where they can find your comedy on social media. Um, just Andrew Flaggy on Facebook. I don't. I just post jokes and shit. Like, I don't actually, like, I don't post a lot of clips. Um, you can check out, I guess, the clips I have on YouTube. It's just Drew Flaggy, um, F-L-A-G-G-E. Um, I have a couple clips. Some of them are old. I don't post full 15-minute, 20-minute clips if it's not something entirely new. Mm -hmm. So I have stuff. I just don't want to post it. Um, otherwise, Drew Flaggy Comedy on Instagram. Um, I just usually post show posters and where I'm going to be at for shows. Like this, uh, like I said, this Thursday, I'm going to be at Oat Brewing uh, in West Dallas. I have some weird corporate show that Brandon Wine put together on Friday. I guess it's supposed to be a clean show when he put me and Reagan on it. So that's fucked uh -huh. up. Like, <laughs> Um, otherwise that I'm always around the Milwaukee area, you know, just check, uh, check out laughing tap in the improv and see, you know, go see some comedy out there. Appreciate you dog for coming on the show. Appreciate you for giving us some nuggets about the bucks and comedy, especially. Um, I love, I love watching your sets. I love to learn from you as a comic. You're doing it, man. You're the man. Keep on going. Once again, appreciate you for coming on the show and thank you guys for watching another episode of the greatly destined podcast. We are out here. See you guys next time.